This is the Friday, October 30th, 2015 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is Sue Martin. Sue, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Now, I had to cut you off when you were discussing the hog market on the program. So I, I want to jump right in with that. Where do you see hogs going? Well, I thought it was interesting because October hogs went off the board on their highs. And right as the news that China was also uh, dropping their ban and allowing, what, 14 more packing houses to be able to ship pork to China, mm -hmm. all of a sudden World Health Organization and a newspaper in the UK bring out all this talk about um, uh, processed meats, um, number one carcinogenic. And then red bee or red meats, yes. number two. And in the headlines of the newspaper was bacon, I think it was bacon, ham, sausage, and hot dogs. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, bacon's good on everything, even a mouse trap, it's good on that too. <laughs> and I tell you what, I thought, really? And the market started to break, and I thought, well, you know, maybe it's just going to take a, catch its breath for a minute. Seasonally, hogs do go down into the last month or week of October and sometimes into the first few days or so of November. And so I thought that's just what we're just following a season. But the slide has been huge. And the pork carcass has dropped $7.84 in a week. That's, that's the biggest drop I've seen. I don't know, it might be historical, but and, it's pretty big. And it's that pork carcass that has really maintained these futures that strengthen exactly. the carcass value. Exactly, and all of a sudden, your fresh meat buyers backed away, and so, you know, the packer taking advantage of this is just knocking the sales out of the downside of the pork or of the hogs coming to market. I think it was down two, two and a half today. And so, you know, I started looking at hogs, and I thought, what's going on here? And I went back all the way to 1969 on Ford and took any year that the hog market went, had October hogs make higher highs in September, October over August. And what did they do? Did they have uh, the ability to expire off decent? And if they did, what did the December do? Well, out of the last 45 years, let's just say since 70, there was 25 of those years that we had this occurrence. And what happened was, out of those 25 years, there were seven years where the December hogs failed. Okay. And so I went back and looked at those. Ironically, many of them were a year of a five. The other thing that was interesting was, and this one really surprised me, was because not only is cattle following 1993, and the grain market's kind of been for a while behaving like 1993, sort of, and all of a sudden, the hog market, I got to looking at 1993's pattern, and I'll be dogged, we're just like 1993. Well, that doesn't spell good things for the hog market. No. And so I fear, I think we come in here, stick a low in here, may have seen it on Friday, and then we turn, but even on Monday we turn, we catch a rally, probably along with sympathy of maybe cattle, but also the other thing is while cattle have been holding stronger, they've been buying cattle, selling hogs on those spreads, but in the meantime, I think the hog market catches a bounce, and you better run for the hills if you're long. Okay. I think we're going down into December. How far down do you think we could go? Low I don't 50s? know. We're within a trend line of the lows of this year. You know, the, mm -hmm. the 55 level on forward. This is our third time at it. So I do think that too. I mean, we're within very near that trend line as of today. So I think come Monday, we either just start up higher or we try to, the first sign of the pork cutout stabilizing and hams, good grief. Bacon, you know, is falling through the floor, but you know, we've got hams really mm -hmm. cheap too. And yet turkey prices are sky high because of the bird flu. And so I think all of a sudden, we maybe somewhere in here we'll catch some fresh demand. Keep some hopeful news on. It got on. cheap enough that they're finally gonna say, hey, we haven't died yet. All of us have been, sure. you know what I mean? It was just rhetoric. And then all of a sudden we turn and we start to get a lift. But I think we have done some damage to this hog market okay. and it's gonna take a while to un you know, to heal up that feeling. And so I think, you know, we'll get this lift. Also, the market had gotten long, pretty heavy long yeah. with that rally in the October. So, you know, it, it uh, suckered a bunch of us in and me too, you know. <laughs> so um, but I think that when we see this this rally, we're gonna want to use it. The rally may only last into the eleventh or sixteenth, okay. something like that. And then I think we turn down again, but it's going to get up high enough 
to be able to have some escape hatch. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now we do have a a number of questions from a lot of our viewers on Twitter and Facebook. And I wanted to start, we talked briefly about 2016 pricing on the program, but Luke in Nebraska is curious. Um, He's thinking 2016 corn acres are soon to be front and center. And he's wondering if the if the lower cost of production, if there is a lower cost of production, will that give us 92 million acres corn next year? Well, I don't disagree with him. First off, just on normal rotation, you're gonna get a bunch more acres. And then the next thing is, is that the yields were so awesome, especially in the Western Corn Belt, even in in portions of where they didn't just get deluged with water, in the Eastern Corn Belt, the yields were pretty decent and respectable. It's pretty variable over there, Mm -hmm. but still. And so I think farmers are gonna remember that. They're happy. They are excited about those yields. So I think they're gonna plant corn. They're already making some of those decisions because now the field work is getting all done. So now they're having to make decisions, do I put on fertilizer now or do I wait till spring? And so I think some of those decisions are being made right now. And the field work, the prep is going to be done. And we're going to go into spring, early Easter. And then usually like with early Easter's, you have early springs. Uh, The Farmer's Almanac's calling for a mild spring, mild and dry. So that means that corn will go in. You might even pull a few more acres on that. And then from there, we'll see where we're at. But I think you're going to see more corn acres but we're the only country that's going to see more corn acres. So that is maybe a good thing because we need to get ourselves in gear here to get things going. We've got to get our exports going. Right. And if if China slows up and does do an anti-dumping uh, um, situation ban on us for bringing in DDGs, all of a sudden, boy, that backs up. They're our largest buyer. They buy 80% of it. Um, I think that all of a sudden they're going to, you know, the ethanol plants is another good wherewithal to take corn. They almost compete for the amount of corn usage as feed usage mm-hmm. does. And so all of a sudden, they're going to back up. I think farmers could really be looking at a tough situation down the road. And you know, and you and I were talking about basis levels, and I think we have two separate markets here, the Eastern Corn Belt. We're already seeing Wilmington, North Carolina, pulling corn in from Brazil. That's right. And that, they're gonna keep doing it, it's cheap, and it makes it easier than railing it in, and because they have to pull it from the west. And in the meantime, so the Eastern Corn Belt, when there's corn needed, they'll push those bids to pull the corn. Those guys are gonna be blessed. Okay. They just don't have as much of it. The Western Corn Belt, I almost think if you get a post-harvest rally, and I'm not saying this because I'm a broker, I'm saying it because I think the basis is gonna bite this next year unless we get a rip roar and and then it won't even help us on the oat crop. Mm -hmm. I think that farmers need to market that corn if they can and, and on that basis take it so they get advantage of it and then turn around and own the futures back right. if you can. Um, if you are not inclined for futures, then buy calls at the money and turn around and maybe sell like $5 calls or 450 calls, something that makes you take out the highs of this year because corn's got an inside range year. We're gonna do something this next year and I think you know we gotta also remember and nobody talks about it, but corn has these humongous gaps that were left from 2013. And the and, drought year, yes. Oh my God, and they're huge. They are just huge. Um, Dease corn, 632 to 710. You know, those are big gaps. All the market needs is a nudge. And this next year, Dease corn may get that nudge. July has it too. Okay. And we may get the nudge, but it's gonna come off of weather and nothing else, I don't okay. think. Okay, all right. So with that, Sue, we're gonna let you go. Thanks for taking the time to join us this week. Really appreciate your insight. Thank you. You probably thought I was on (laughs) Ripfield. And thanks to all of you for sending in your questions via Facebook and Twitter. Please continue to do so, and we will get expert analysis right to you. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.